Welcome to the Vet to Vet Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Fitters. Join me as I talk to fellow veterans about their military experiences. Experiences from Vietnam to Operation Enduring Freedom. This podcast is sponsored by Tugs. Talking, understanding, growing, and supporting. Even big ships need a little help sometimes. Feel free to hit the subscribe button below to get our latest Vet to Vet interview. Feel free to like, share, and leave a comment below. And thanks for joining us. We're sitting down today with uh, Army Spec 4 Joe Pankowskis. Pankowskis. I I don't know why. I just can't get that down, and I apologize for that. Uh, So let's start off with uh, what life was like for Joe before the military. Well, I was born in Ellsworth Air Force Base in uh, South Dakota. My dad was an Air Force veteran. And in, I guess it was 1971, we moved to Orfordville when he got a job at General Motors. And oh, okay. So I went through grade school and high school at Parkview, graduated from Parkview, and had a year of college at the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Oh, okay. The pioneers. Yep. <laughs> I, uh, and what year was that at? I went to Platteville in 84. Okay. And uh, college life just wasn't for me, so I. Went for a year, and then I enlisted. Oh, okay. And you enlisted in the Army? I, I was in the Army. And when did we take off for basic? I believe it was November of 84. I went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma as a 13 Bravo. Okay, and that is a what? That's a cannon crewman. Okay, all right, all right. Anything interesting in uh, basic training that strikes your memory? Well, it, it went... It went when I went, it was that 13-week program. You did your eight weeks of basic and then straight into your AIT, so you were together the whole 13 weeks. And Okay. But, no, I just grew up a little bit. and I, I, think, <laughs> I think we all do in basic. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then uh, we get done with uh, ATI or AIT. Where do we go from there? Uh, my first duty station was uh, with the 8th and 8th, uh, 2nd Infantry Division in Camp Stanley, Korea. Okay, and what town is that near, you remember? Uh, we were down near Wijambu. Okay, all right, all by, right. By Camp Casey there. Oh, all right, I know where Camp Casey <laughs> is from a prior uh, podcast. Uh, so what was life like in Korea? It, was, uh, it wasn't too bad, but you learned the different cultures and learned, learned a lot about a di- different pe- people and culture. And, and what, what sticks out from their culture that uh, you remember? Well, part of the big thing was uh, you learned uh, the males were more dominant over there. If if you were a man, I mean, the the girls, you no, know, the education wise and everything, they were the lower class, and it was mm-hmm. just different. And yep, a very male dominant uh, society, that's for yes, sure. It, yes, it was, and uh, a lot of respect towards uh, the males in uh, in that regard. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of the food while you're there? It was, you know, I got used to it. But the, the, the kimchi, it took a while to get used to the kimchi. But and did we have any soju while we were there? I I don't have to be embalmed when I pass away <laughs> because I'm already already got enough of that in my system. <laughs> yep, yep. A lot of people, a lot of people who have ever or anybody who's ever been to Korea knows what soju is. Um, it's. Uh, very potent alcohol with uh, formaldehyde mixed Formal- in, and uh, it, it it sticks with you for a while. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> All right. And what did and we what did we do while we were in Korea? As far as job wise, same thing. Uh, yeah, I was uh, I was a cannon crewman. I was on a uh, my first tour over there. I had two tours in Korea. My first tour was on a one nine or eight howitzer, which is a, a one five five millimeter. Unit. Not a small gun by any means. No, not not <laughs> small. But it, yeah, they got. Uh, I don't know too much about the army, so I'm not going to play like I do. Um, and what's the range of those? I say about the range on a one nine or eight would have been about fourteen miles. Yeah, and, that, that, and what do you remember? What size shell? It was a one five five millimeter. Okay. And was that the sulfite, sulfur shells or the uh, or sulfite or sulfur shells yeah. or the other ones? The, the, the white, well, you had the white powder, the powder bags, and yep. then you had your red bags. And so 
Yeah, that, I, I uh, remember seeing those in when I was over there. It was kind of interesting. Um, and how long were you on your first tour? How long were you there? Uh, the tours over there were 12 months, so you were over there for a year. And that is without family, if I remember correctly. Back then it was without family. Yeah, and I, what do they call them, tours? Um, oh. All of a sudden I got a, a blank space when it comes to those. Uh, was it, wasn't it hardship tours? Hardship tours, yep, yep. And uh, technically in the 80s, we had not been, a peace treaty had not been signed with the Koreans. Well, there is still, it's still no peace treaty. It is considered a uh, ceasefire. So technically we are still at odds with yeah. the North Koreans. Yeah. So are you a veteran of that then? Can you, I can't remember how that works. If you were there over 90 days, you can be a, a veteran or something like that. Because we were there 60 days and they told us we didn't qualify. I, I believe that's the... Something. I'm not sure about nowadays, but yeah. I, I was there in the in the early '80s. And what was uh, what was the relationship like with the locals there? You know, the, they were very kind. They were very kind to us. I mean, they 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 wanted us there at that time. Because yeah, I know when I was there in '89, I think it was, they were protesting um, about us being there, and it was kind of a. It, it was a tough time, but it was always, you know, I was there during Desert, they're not Desert Storm, but... Uh, uh, team Spirit. Team Spirit, and uh, we bulk up, and it mm-hmm. gets some locals a little uh, upset. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they were protesting most of the time we were there. Uh, and what was barracks life like? Did you live on base or off base? Oh, when I was there, everybody was everybody was on post. You lived you lived in the barracks. There was no off post, no off post housing. You had the NCOs in the NCO barracks, and then. And what was life like in the barracks? Uh, we had a uh, maybe three four men to a room. And then we had the katusas. That, I mean, each each uh, each battery or gun section had a what we call katusas which are Koreans authenticated to the United States Army, which oh, okay. they would, you know, help us, you know, help us out, and they were associated with the, the U.S. Army, and they operated under the ROC, which would be the Republic. Yep, Republic of Korea. Yeah. Yep, I remember there we had some of those during Team Spirit running around. Um, and so we worked hard and played hard, or? Well, there was a lot of play, and I mean... <laughs> You finish you finish your day in the motor pool or whatever you did. Then you get your pass and you go through the gate and out to the Vills and Yeah, and uh life in the Ville is uh it's, not life on the post. <laughs> yeah, it's not life on the post, uh but uh over there we did a lot of we did a lot of field training. We'd go out for maybe a week at a time and come back and then like each bat, each uh, unit would have a time. They had a firing base up there near the DMZ called 4P3. Okay. And you did your tour up on 4P3, which would be about a month or so up there. So you got to see the DMZ. Oh, I was right up on, up by Freedom Bridge and the bridge and no return. And what'd you think of all that? It it's amazing. It's a it's a whole new experience. I mean, people don't realize when we were over there. They had the story about. Uh, a four four million dollar bounty on the Korean North Korean flag, <laughs> but they don't realize that flag is raised by cranes and it's about the size of a football field. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It'd be kind of tough smuggle. It'd be that. <laughs> tough to get get the flag. <laughs> so, and uh, a Freedom Bridge for anybody that doesn't know, you want to explain to them what that is. Freedom Bridge is uh, the bridge coming from uh, up in the north part of Korea back back down and it, I mean it's up there on the D and as being a fire point up there it was our job to provide the coverage if anything was to happen so the ones on the other side of Freedom Bridge could get across okay so we we uh, provided a uh, would do fire and set up a sector where they could come across yeah and, and uh 
if, if I remember correctly, there was a lot in the 80s. There was a lot of uh, North Korean defection into the uh, South Korean area. Right. Well, up, up there in that area, there's a little, it's like a little village set up. And then, I mean, there's a hooch is built up in there, and it's all lit up, which acts as a buffer between the north and the south. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, talking about hooches, uh, that struck my memory of being <laughs> over there. The living conditions that the uh, average Korean lives in, whether it be south, well, we'll just stick to the South Koreans. Uh, how would you compare that to how the average American lives? Well, the little the little hooches were just little structures, like little huts, and mm -hmm. I mean, they for heating they had charcoal charcoal heating they heated up in the winter time and. Yeah. They were just little huts where basically just one little room where they slept and everything right there. I mean, yeah, it was, uh, from my recollection, it was very small. Um, they were very family-oriented. Oh, yeah. And the whole family would be living in these little areas uh, that I don't think Americans would be too comfortable in. No, I don't think so. You know, <laughs> the idea of having your own room over there was kind of... Uh, uh, definitely for the higher society than uh, what we're used to, that's well, for sure. Well, your bed was rolled up every morning because they're usually yeah. just mats or blankets, or so everybody just slept in one little... Yeah, we used to make the <laughs> joke, and it probably, you know, back then, being young and dumb, uh, that they slept in shifts because there were so <laughs> many of them in the rolling, rolling of the uh, mattresses out. Uh so, food-wise, what did you think of their food? It, it, it was spicy. You know, you kind of had to watch where you ate and what mm -hmm. you ate because you never knew what was going to... How it was going to affect you the next day during well, PT or... <laughs> that was the bad thing about PT. When you had the katusas, they'd be eating that kimchi all the time, and yeah. it, it came out in the morning PT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, very much so. And then, uh, so... When we got done with our first tour, where'd we go from there? From uh, Korea. Well, I did my 12 months in Korea, and then I got shipped to uh, Fort Ord, California for three years. And I oh, did okay. two years at, uh, with the 7th, 15th Field Artillery in uh, Fort Ord. Okay. I, yeah, I've heard of Fort Ord. Uh, pretty substantial size base, if I remember correctly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was life like for a Wisconsin boy in uh, California? <laughs> Uh, California wasn't my cup of tea. I thought it was a little crowded, and people really didn't. I like a place where you can go, and if you go in, people sit there and talk to you. There, it was the people were kind of to themselves or yeah. in group, so clicky. Y yes, yeah, clicky. And I, the thing that I remember about uh, all the deployments and stuff like that is, especially overseas or you know where have you. Uh, the military was, it seemed like we were respected more when we walked off base by uh, that country and the citizens of that country than sometimes back here at home when we'd go off our base or post. Uh, we just kind of, they kind of looked at us as it was just a regular job. Uh, so it, I, I enjoyed, you know, deploying, whether it be, you know, Japan, Korea, or where have you. And just that level of respect, and it was it was kind of a mutual respect. I think uh, we always reached out to you know to find out what their cultures were like and interact with them, and I think they enjoyed that because we did take interest in uh, what their life was like, and they obviously uh, wanted to know what our life was like as well. And being in the military, you can't tell them too much, but you know, but like stateside though, you don't get that. Right, and I, I I I enjoy my time in the service because I did get to see a lot of countries that I would never have seen before. Absolutely. I mean, I got to go to Panama for jungle training, and I got six months TDY in Alaska. And <laughs> yeah, Alaska, <I've, laughs> I, I I can live without that one. I we stopped in Alaska once, and that was enough for me. Very expensive. It, it was. It was, and Hawaii was too. Yes. It's like. Uh, and those are part of the United States. I get that, but it, it's it's a different world, 
it really is, uh, at least Alaska is. Uh, you got to be tough to live in Alaska, yeah. you know. Uh, so we're at Fort Ord uh, doing the same thing. I was uh, still I don't know, eight years field artillery, so my, eight, my whole eight years was artillery. When I was in uh, California at Fort Ord, I was on the small pop guns, the the do the little deuce. Okay. Okay, and what's their range? I, I've seen uh, those. That's, I'm not exactly sure about the range, but not quite as far as the big gun. Okay. It was only 105 millimeter. Okay, yeah, I've, them, them are, uh, they're important though. Uh, they're they're a little bit smaller, but uh, they're just as important. Uh, anything exciting happened in California while you're there? Or? Well, that I was with what they they called them the light fighters, and you went to, and that's where I got. Uh, sent over for my uh, my jungle training. Okay. We went over as a unit and did the. Uh, How long jungle. were you in Panama? Oh, we were only there for a few weeks to do the to do the training and. And what did you think of Panama? I thought it was I thought it was fun. I think everybody enjoys <laughs> Panama. I don't know why, but you know, unless it was uh, when they were doing uh, real operations down there. Uh, I think everybody who's ever went to Panama has always had a good... Uh, nice trip over the lock. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Always had a, a, a positive experience down there. And the Panaman people were quite very, supportive. Very yeah, friendly. friendly. Yeah. 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 Uh, unlike Californians. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we do the jungle training. We come back, and uh, we were there for three years, Three years said? at Three years at uh, Fort, Fort... I was there from... Uh, well, I left... Korea in 85 over there from like 86 through 87 or 85 through 87. Okay. And then I got deployed back to, back to Korea. <laughs> <laughs> another hardship tour. Another, another 12 months in Korea, but I enjoyed myself over there. Same base? Uh, same, same unit, eight, eighth and eighth field artillery. Ah. Okay. I was Bravo battery, uh, my first tour and Charlie Battery is second tour. Okay, and uh, you want to explain to those that aren't military what a what a battery is in regards to structure wise in the army. Well, a battery is uh, what's comprised of uh, sections. We had six gun sections made up of battery, and each each battalion had three. Batteries. You had Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. So there'd be like eighteen gun sections in that mm -hmm. in that unit. So yeah, I think the Air Force. We are squad, uh, flight squadron. We have different flights, just like you guys have uh, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. Um, then we have different squadrons, and then we have wings. So it's the, well, yeah, each, it's all the same. So I was in Bravo Battery, and then the ba uh, battery broke up into what they call platoons. You had first platoon and second yeah. platoon, and then each platoon had three gun sections. So you had six gun sections. In each one? Well, three in each platoon. Oh, yeah, yeah. So all together we had six gun sections and a battery. And were any of the individuals there that were there the first time around? Uh, no, not. They changed every... Swap out every twelve months. Every twelve months. Yeah. Uh, had the culture changed at all when you went off base by that time? Well, in eighty four when I was over there, it was a uh, like it said the hooches and everything, and you go to Seoul. It wasn't as built up. They had heard they were going to have the Olympics, so when I was over there in eighty eight. I went into Seoul, and you had the big old apartment buildings oh, and all the yeah. clubs, and I mean, it was all all ready for the visitors to come over. So it was quite different in that respect. That you know, turned into a tourist. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. And while you were there, did you uh, have any have an opportunity to go check out any of the temples at all? I I, I went to a few of the the temples. They're amazing, from what I hear. I never got to see one, but I wish I would have. Oh. They're, they're all over, and they're yeah. quite, yeah, quite amazing. Yeah, uh, and the cultural dress that uh, they wear over there. The, the, the kimono, like the kimono, all very colorful and... Yeah, and just beautiful. Uh, and the fabrics are, you know, top-notch, and 
and talking about clothes, you could just about buy Nikes for well, like five or ten bucks. But I was going to say Nikes for five or ten dollars. You could have a seven-piece suit made for seventy-five dollars. Yep, custom made, <laughs> custom made. Uh, Turkey was the same way, uh, where you could just go in, they size you up, and within probably a week or two weeks, uh, you'd be all set up. And then you go into the leather shops, and just with a drawing and tell them exactly what you wanted or even a photograph and it'd be custom made for you it was it was neat it was it was amazing what odyssey could make with the stuff they had over there There were so many things you could buy that was just he could make something out of anything (laughs) yeah and you know that's part of their culture they didn't waste a whole lot and um they were masters of their crafts i mean when they learn something they learn something uh, one of the things that I that sticks out about uh, my time in Korea is they could take a, almost, a, you know, from their fields and stuff, they can take almost a gallon of water and move it anywhere they wanted to move it, you know, whether it be through canals or um, irrigation or what have you. They were fantastic uh, stewards of the land when it comes to uh, their use of water, and they made good use of it to make what they had to make, you know whether it be food or what have you. Uh, so you're in your second deployment over there. Uh, still barracks life? It was still still the barracks, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and any interesting stories from barracks life that, that you can share? Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if there's too many we could share. <laughs> yeah, for those that don't understand, barracks is, uh, I don't know, it can be almost like a nightclub in itself sometimes at night. Uh, if you worked second or third shift, there, sometimes you didn't get a whole lot of sleep because the party was rolling. Uh, and then there were safety briefings because of the barracks <laughs> party. So, uh, yeah, it, uh, barracks life is kind of where everybody unites. It's you, their own little fraternity. Yeah. You get to know each other, uh, regardless of what jobs they were, they, um, were assigned to and, you made friends for life, you know, while you were there, uh, because you lived with them, you breathed with them. Uh, they either lived down the, a couple doors down from your, you know, in, in sometimes in the same room with you. Um, and it's all walks of life, uh, whether it be, uh, Asian, Afri- African, American, uh, Hispanic. Um, I, I had a, a roommate, all the time that I was in, I had a roommate from pretty much all walks of life, so it was kind of interesting. Well, those are the people you're around every day. You're, you're there with them for 12 months. Yeah. And uh, those are the only people you associate with, so you do become you do become a family. Yeah. And if shit hits a fan, that family is they're what's the one. Good. They're the ones that you can depend on. Yep. Yep. And they earn that dependency. I mean, they earn. That uh, that title of uh, brother or sister because you know they're going to be there, uh, so yeah, I, I, I get that, and that's what you know. That's barracks life and work life. You, know, you kind of get that all together. Yeah. Uh, so after Korea, where did we go from there? Uh, after the twelve months there, I came back to where I took my basic back to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And Oklahoma is a pretty state. I, I enjoyed uh, going to Oklahoma, not military-wise, but uh, going down there to hang out for a few months. Uh, anything interesting in Oklahoma that sticks out? Well, I guess uh, what sticks out there the most is that's where I was deployed from to the to the Gulf. Okay, let's let's get right into that then. So you're with Fort at Fort Sill, uh, same job, same gun. Still, still a cannon? No. When I got to Oklahoma, I went to the, I went from a towed unit to, uh, I went to the M110 Alpha One, the mm-hmm. eight-inch howitzer. Okay, <laughs> yeah, them are the big guns. The big gun. <laughs> All right, and then uh, yeah, what, uh, what month or year do you remember deploying? I deployed in, uh, well, let's see, we spent Christmas and Thanksgiving over in the Gulf, so it was about maybe September that we were shipped over. And uh, what was that trip like going over there? Well, we had shipped all our equipment out, and we flew out on civilian airlines. Mm -hmm. So we flew civilian airlines over there. And where would you fly out of? 
We flew out of Oklahoma, to, and then there were the different stops. I think we were uh, in Massachusetts, and then the Brussels, and then over. So oh. there were some stops along the way. And then where did you guys land at in the Middle East to start with? I believe we were down there. Was it Daharan? We were. We were. Uh, they put us up in a uh, one of their guard training bases, or they wanted to climatize us so they put us up there for like three days and then to get used to the weather and get wait for our equipment get the equipment set then we rolled out rolled out to the desert and we set up a base camp we named Alpha Alpha Courage okay Okay. so we sat out in the middle of the desert living in GP medium tents and oh wow And having lots of sand. <laughs> lots of sand. Whether it be eating, sleeping, or anything else. <laughs> uh, and when we were at uh, AAC, or ACC, I should say, um, any action at all or any con- uh, interaction with the Iraqis? Uh, no, this was, uh, I was there in the shield before the storm, so this is what we just rolled in and set up, and we had like a, up on Wheeling Hill was the 218th Field Artillery, and then 318th was on the other side of the hill. And while we were there, uh, a medical unit moved in, and they set up this big, uh, it was like a big blow-up hospital. They blew up the big old, mm-hmm. set up a surgical unit there. And just before the air war started, a, a British uh, transportation unit loaded our loaded our howitzers up and moved us up to the berm. Okay. And the, just waited for the airstrike to start. And uh, how how was how was it like when the airstrike started? Well, we were we were in in foxholes, and you could just hear and see the planes fly over. Thought the sand was going to cover us up, but I, you <laughs> you wouldn't believe the the rumbling that you can get from a. They had the B twenty nines drop doing carpet bombing, and yep. you should see the. See the damage one of those can do. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are impressive. They are impressive. But, uh, but were you guys in mop gear or? We uh, they had called. Uh, I think we were a whole week wearing the same NBC suit. Mm-hmm. And you know those charcoal line yep. suits. <laughs> They're nice and cool. Never. <laughs> <laughs> but we were in there for a week straight without changing them. We weren't in the. Ma- I mean, our detectors would go off saying, you know, but they said, well, it's nothing that the, the sand set them off, so we don't know. So finally, they're pulling the batteries out of the, <laughs> the detectors. and now, that was, there was, oh, during Desert Storm, there was always a threat of scuds. Uh, there, uh, a matter of fact, speaking of scuds, when we, when the, the, the final, when they called the end of it, they took us back to what they call Cobar Towers so we could, Get the equipment ready to ship back and and cleaned up and stuff and the bar- uh, the building they put us up in these big old apartment type buildings and the the one right next to where they they set us up was where the uh, Scud missile had hit and killed some of those Americans oh, wow. over there so we were right next to the building that the Scud missile had hit do during you, the. Do you remember what city that was in? Uh, Co- Co- Cobar. Or? Cobar. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so how long were you deployed in the desert for altogether? All or together. I should say for Desert Storm. I got there in like, like September or so, and we left in uh, March. So about six months or so, or maybe a little more. So. And overall, uh, how would you describe your your deployment? Mm, it was different uh you know, really, we really don't talk about it much uh, okay uh, whatever you want to talk about we talk about whatever you don't it, we don't. it, 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 it was different you know the first time you get incoming coming in on you it's a whole different world <laughs> your perspective changes <laughs> yes it does uh they say once a uh, person has experienced combat that a part of that person dies right there and is reborn a, a different person. And for the remainder of their life, they try to get back to who they were prior to that uh, first uh, that first conflict, whether it be gunfight or incoming or what have you. 
Um, and that's what a lot of our veterans uh, struggle with every day, is trying to get back to who they were. Well, you know? uh, we had, our duty was, we were attached to 12th Brigade, which went over and was assigned to 7th Corps. So we went up to the middle of Iraq. We were supposed to go up to MS, what they call MRS-1 or the Euphrates River Valley. Mm-hmm and do the hook by the Marines to the, uh, the amphibious landing. Yeah, and that, that was impressive. And that was Schwarzkopf that yep, was in General, charge of that? General Schwarzkopf. Yeah. May you rest in peace, hell of a man. But uh, we went through an area, what they called uh, Hell's Highway. Okay. So that yep. is something I wish nobody would have to ever experience. And... Um, to des- I'll, I'll describe that. Uh, it was just that. It was a highway that went through hell. Um, there were uh, tanks, there were ve- uh, private vehicles. Uh, that's where uh, people were blown up. There was body parts, there was burning uh, personnel, uh, whether it be civilian or military, uh, from Kuwaiti or Iraq or... Um, uh, any other, I, I can't remember if any other country was involved in that, but uh, I'll have photos of that um, on the background here uh, when I do the editing. Um, that is a very tough thing to take. Um, that's a very that's a memory that probably will burn into anybody's. Uh, I don't even want to say burn into their memory, but it burns into the brain and stays there forever. You'll you'll never forget anything like that. No. Um, and I'm sure just talking about it brings back uh, the smell, the visions, and stuff like that. And I apologize. Uh, I don't want to put you through that, but uh, I just want the listeners to understand what you went through and uh, how difficult that is for all our veterans who have went through um, a conflict, that it's, it's not an easy walk in the park uh, afterwards. You just don't move on with life um, because you've seen uh, other people's lives that didn't get to be able to uh, be able to move on um, and that can cause issues uh, down the line whether it be family or uh, friends or what have you and uh, I get that I get that and I, I, I again apologize I don't want to take you down a road you don't want to go down but I just want people to understand that that's a it's a difficult situation for all veterans that have been in any type of conflict. So, uh, so we, uh, when did we clear out of the uh, highway to hell? Oh, that we went through it moving up to. Uh, I don't know exactly when we. It was pretty much going when we were going through. I don't when they got the cleanup done. Okay. Okay. Uh, and that took a while. Yes. To do, do the cleanup. Well, I heard today you can st- go over there and still see some of the the scrap in the desert. I'm not sure, but that's what I've I've heard others say that it's still reminders there to this date. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't doubt that. Um, they're very the people in that region are very c- full of pride for their culture, and. Uh, Sometimes they just walk away from things and leave it there as a remembrance, or they memorialize it. Um, you know, Carl, um, I have had him on here once before, and he was uh, talking about the uh, the wall, um, and I don't know if we caught that on tape or not, um, where officers from Kuwaiti were shot and that the holes were still, still in, in the wall. wall. And to be able to go up and touch those bullet holes you know in the wall uh it, it's it's a very special thing it's not just a wall to anybody who's in the military that's a wall where somebody was a- executed or that's somewhere uh a wall that uh veterans from another country made their last stand and those are are special moments but they're also very sad moments for uh uh veterans alike whether they be from the united states or be from kuwait or 
uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, or even probably Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, those are special sites that um, their memories still live there. Yeah. So, uh, so they get that all cleaned up, and then uh, after we went up the uh, or down or up the uh, highway to hell, where'd we go from there? I'll take you to a higher point instead of <laughs> taking it lower. Sorry uh, about that, Joe. Uh, well, the war only lasted a hundred hours, so mm -hmm. we uh, we had our experiences. Well, we pulled into one. We got a call for a fire mission, so we pulled up and we set up and we started our fire mission, and we're shooting through the night. Come daylight, it's getting light. We start looking around and finding weapons on the ground. <laughs> Here we pulled in the middle of one of our encampments, and we had Iraqi soldiers in foxholes around us. Oh, my, yeah. We ended up taking the, well, we didn't take them prisoner because at that point the U.S. stopped taking prisoners, and they were just letting them. Mm -hmm. Just go back home. Go, go back. So, you know, we, it was quite strange, you know, uh, going around and finding all of these foxholes with people in them. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I know uh, they surrendered by the thousands, and uh, at some point we were just well, we, we gave know what to we do gave them. them food or water, and they just turned around and crawled back in the holes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I don't know if the Republican Guard was that far south or not. Well, I can't the, remember. The, the ones we were, the ones we had mostly seen were a lot of them were older gentlemen or young young kids, and uh, we ran into one. That we were taught that spoke English, and he had been a student at the university in the states. Oh, okay. And uh, we got that the only reason a lot of them were fighting is because Saddam and his Republican Guard were threatening to kill their family members if mm -hmm. they didn't fight. So yeah, yeah, and I don't think a lot of people understood that um, <coughs> that we have. Um, our own pride and our own military and our own country. And we've never had a ruler that uh, threatens the life of our our family for us to go out and fight. We did it voluntarily. Um, in some cases, some guys were drafted I, and, and gals, and I get that. But for the most part, we're a voluntary force, uh, which, for good or bad, uh, kind of leads us to fight to the death where when you're it's just a regime like that threatening your your family you, your heart's not really in the fight right. and your heart's back home with your family that's being threatened so yeah that okay i get that mm. <laughs> you know well he kept his republican guard more towards him and he had his weaker troops up oh. in the front yeah so that's the way he Mostly did his, the ones that we ran into were more or less just basic troops just thrown together to hold the position or something. Yeah, yeah. So just for anybody out there that's from a different country, we send our fucking best at you and you back the <laughs> fuck down. And I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't send out the people that don't want to be there. We send out the ones that are going to come get you. So, anyway, that's that. <laughs> I had to throw that in there. <laughs> uh, so, uh, all together, uh, when, you know, we wake up and we got uh, foxholes and guns and uh, people surrendering, giving them food, giving them water. Uh, after the 100 hours, what were you guys uh, up to? What were you guys doing? Well, a few days after it ended, we got sent, sent back to... Uh Cobalt Towers to, uh, you know, get things ready and organized and ready to ship back. So I don't know how long we were at Cobalt Towers, maybe a couple weeks or so, cleaning things up and preparing to go back. And Typical military, hurry up and wait. <laughs> we got we got shipped back, and it was, uh, I believe, March, sometime March of 92. Okay. And what was it like coming back to the U.S.? Uh, Compared to, let's say, our Vietnam vets? Uh, 
the people. I mean, we got we got back we got back to Sill and they picked us up and paraded through the street. They escorted the buses back to base and people lined up along the streets, which our Vietnam vets did not get. No, they didn't. And they're the ones that are mainly responsible for um, Desert Storm, Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, Kosovo vets getting the welcoming home that they deserve. Um, that generation uh, went above and beyond to make sure that our, our brothers well, and my, sisters are my dad was a Vietnam, right. My dad was a Vietnam vet, and I, I would get letters and photos and newspaper clippings of all the Vietnam veterans back here home that were having parades and everything else. You're right, the Vietnam vets were the ones that started the yep. like, they'll go on and welcome. I mean, giving us what they didn't get when they came home. Yeah, and to this day, every time I uh, get introduced to or uh, meet a uh, Vietnam vet, um, I always say the same thing, welcome home. Just uh, so at least somebody, I'm sure other people have told them that, but just so they understand. Give, give them the recognition that they, you know, they deserve. And that they didn't get the first time around. And I get it, it's politics and all that stuff, but still, those that go out and give their life or put their life on the line um, deserve a, at least a, a welcome home. You they know, do. Type deal. All right, so we get back to Fort Sill after uh, being deployed, and what was life like there? Well, by then I, I was thinking, you know, this is where I get my regrets. Yeah. I, uh, at the time I got home, and I said, well, I'm, I'm tired of this. So I ETS'd in June of 92. Okay. And now I look back at it and say, God, I wish I would have stayed in and retired. I had eight years. I wish I would put 20 in. I think every, at least most, uh, majority, after they get out, they, they wish they would have stayed in. Yeah. yeah. Get, get that a lot. Uh, and, I, and I think a lot of that is... The adventures that we go on, whether it be TDY or deployment or just traveling around to different cultures, but it's also that brother and sisterhood um, and that discipline, um, being told when to do something, how to do something, and moving up the ranks to uh, be a mentor to our lower troops and also uh being good subordinates to those that are above us. Well, that's what, what you said earlier. It's like a brotherhood. I mean, you can look at these be it black, white, Asian. There's no color in a service. You're no. you're you're a brother. You can brother or sister. You can rely on it, and you know that you can rely on them. And you ain't I got all this bickerism and racism, and yeah. you're a family that sticks together. Yep, yeah. and uh, I. I, when I was stationed in Georgia, uh, the, you know, and this is in the 80s, yeah, late 80s, uh, early 90s, uh, yeah, there was some racism going on offside the base, but there was no racism on the base that I ever witnessed. Uh, matter of fact, one of the gentlemen that I looked up to the most uh, was a, uh, African-American male by the name of uh, Nate Carswell. Uh, very big in life type person. Um, uh, believed in God like most people that I, I just... He, he, he comes across to me as, as a almost like a pastor level. I mean, he's just in, into uh, his religion, but also um, a gentle giant that... Uh, regardless of, you know, race, uh, sex, what have you, Nate was always there for everybody. You know, um, he passed away a couple of years ago here now. Um, but, you know, for a, a black man to be as larger than life type personality in the South at that time, you know, on base, well, you know, off base, probably, I don't know if he'd be able to get away with being who he was. But on base, he definitely could be who he wanted to be. You know, and I, I think everybody loved him for the the man that he was. I really do. Well, me, me and my 
Well, I call my brothers and sisters. We only seen one color, and that was green. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we seen blue. <laughs> you know, and then when we went to other bases, you know, we seen uh, green as well, and then white when well, we. You know, and no, then, nobody's going to do it alone. Everybody's got to do it together, be it your Marine, your Army, your Navy, your yeah. Air Force, Coast Guard. Now, when you see the Marines, you see multicolored because <laughs> they're eating crayons. <laughs> <so that's why. laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. I love the Marines. Like I said, I, I wouldn't go to any type of conflict without them. But, uh, so we get out, and then what do we decide to do after uh, life in the military? What, well, what was it like, the adjustment? It wasn't too bad. Just go around, and find a job, work. Yeah. Yeah. Use your GM dis- discount. Use your dad got. <laughs> <laughs> kids, yeah. kids still use it to this day. <laughs> uh, yep, I, I, I know, I know. Uh, my last guest, uh, Norm Gepler, he, he was talking about his son uh, using the GM discount too. I don't know if that made the made the uh, editing, but yeah. Uh, anything else you want to talk about, Joe? Since I got you here. Yeah, no, but I appreciate the time and you have me to at least tell my story and I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I uh, uh, it, it, we've had to try making our schedules work throughout <laughs> uh, throughout this, but we finally got her done and uh, uh, I've enjoyed it and uh, in my opinion, it's been a fantastic interview. Thank you. Alrighty, for the rest of you veterans out there, keep your head up and moving forward.